the penchant for idolatry? The penchant for idolatry. Hmm. Penchant. What is penchant? Penchant is a strong affiliation, a strong liking to. Interesting to note, the word penchant obviously is not in the authorized version of, of the scriptures, but the word penchant also is not in Webster's 1828 dictionary. Very interesting. But the strong liking, the willingness or wanting to commit adultery, uh, adultery to commit idolatry, hmm. What is an idol? What is idolatry? Hmm. Please get your authorized version of the scriptures. Please follow me along in the scriptures that you and I will be looking at today. Please, please follow me along. This is a very important video that needs to be done today uh, because when someone tells you, and this unfortunately is the case with those who are saved of the Church of the Living God or Church of God, and even those you wicked lost people. When someone tells you you don't you can't have something, your flesh naturally says what? Why? I want it, right? Right? So when someone tells you you can't have anything or you shouldn't do that, it's not good for you, your flesh immediately questions like, well, why not? Why not? And that makes you gravitate to that thing. And with what the Jesuit order has done with the psychological operation, which is still in effect, it ain't over yet, people. Come on now, wake up and smell the coffee, okay? They have made a bunch of people idolaters. Why? Because think about it, okay? With their lockdowns and all their mandates and stuff like that, they say they put a limit on things. It's like, well, you can't have these certain things now, or you got to go through X, Y, Z to get these certain things now. And when you deprive people of their covetousness, that makes them covet even more, doesn't it? And hence, deprive people of their wants and their needs. That gives them what? makes them look at those things that they once had and held in reverence even more so as an idol. Hmm. Hmm. And the thing about idolatry that we got to remember, dear brethren, you uh, wicked people too, lost people, um, those who are in idolatry are truly lacking the relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, that ought to be there, but isn't. So what do they do? They look for idols to fill that void. Whatever that void, whatever that, whatever it is that they're looking for. It could be a man. It could be a philosophy. It could be a hell a day. It could be an actual idol, a visual um, illustration. It could be an idol, like a statue or something like that. It could be a thought. It could be whatever, okay? And see, right away, people who want to defend idolatry in religion, oh, there's a really big thing, uh, there's a really big idol and idolatry, okay? Uh, scripture tells us what true religion is, okay? The religion that is today is an idol and has become idolatry. But see, people who are religious, more so even Christian, want to defend their, do things that's like, to defend their idolatry. It's like, well, an idol is always just a statue, just a man-made graven image. That's all an idol is. It doesn't mean anything else, really. 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 Are you in idolatry? What is idolatry? An idol is something, you know, in a broader sense, dear people, an idol is something that takes the place of God, which ought to be there in you. Okay? Simply put. Simply put. And idolatry is the act of worshiping. And what is worship? 
The Lord had me to do a video uh, almost a year ago by uh, and a man who I thought was a brother from Canada. Uh, a man, by the way, not a boy. A man, by the way, um, helped with that video. Um, the video is called The Heart of Worship. Okay, check that out in the description box uh, about what scriptural worship is. Okay, but see, <coughs> man actually was made for what? To have fellowship, to worship God. Okay, some will argue, no, he was made to be a gardener. Uh, we're going to look into that. Okay, but see, man was originally intended. Uh, was made originally because number one God wanted to, but was it was uh, the intention to have fellowship with Him? Okay, okay. We're going to look into all these things, but first off, let's see what is an idol. Okay, and remember, idolatry is the act of worshiping and or venerating. Remember, things that are different are not the same. Veneration is a lesser form of worship, you could say, I guess, okay? There are two different things. Uh, worship, uh, according to scripture, okay? A lot of men today are creating, are worshiping as they would the true and living God. Idols, or idols that are thought, idols that are men, idols that are religion, stuff like that, okay? But what is an idol? What is an idol? Please turn with me in your authorized version of the scriptures that is commonly called the King James Version. Follow me along word for word, verse by verse of what we are going to be looking at today. Okay? Follow me along. Make sure I ain't lying to you. Okay? <laughs> yeah, check me out. Come on. Exodus chapter 20. We are going to be reading the Ten Commandments. Okay? We are going to be reading in Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 on to verse 17. Okay? Brethren, people, how many people are idolaters out there? Even worse, how many people are idolaters and they're Christians? Yeah, they're Christians. Yeah. I'm not a Christian, by the way. I'm of the Church of God. Church of the Living God. I prefer that one. Church of God, Church of the Living God, okay? That's what we call ourselves. The world's called us Christians, okay? You can hide behind that in First Peter all day if you want. No, we never called ourselves that. Thank you very little. Okay, Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 on to verse 17. The thing you got to remember, too, about the Ten Commandments is there are Ten Commandments. The Catholics have removed one of the commandments, the second commandment, and has made the tenth commandment, thou shalt not covet, and bumped it up to twice. So thou shalt not covet has become two commandments instead of one. And Catholicism has removed that so that they can worship or venerate their idols. Okay? You know, they can worship their little idols like they like to do. Okay? Yeah. So, Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 on to verse 17. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. This is the second commandment, by the way. Or any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Now right away they say, see, graven image, graven image, graven image. So it's just talking about a statue or an idol, you know, a statue kind of thing. Well, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath, or, those are big ors in that verse, isn't it? Or that is in the water under the earth. The Jesus fish. Just comes to immediately mind. The Dagon helmet of the Pope. Okay. 
the puppet Pope Francis, you know, the Dagon helmet. He turns his head. It's a fish mouth. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But, okay, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, like stars, the moon, the sun, S-U-N, or that is in the earth beneath, beneath the heaven, oh, like man, and what proceeds from man, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or that is in the water under the earth, and like I already mentioned, the Jesus face. Okay, so yes, it starts with a gra graven image, okay, or any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above. Those are big ors. So yes, it mm -hmm. yes, it's talking about this as a visual illustration of a statue. Okay, it's not. It's but you get it. Okay, so yes, it is talking about a physical statue. But even in the Old Testament, during the giving of the law, which this was, was it just relegated to that? Of course not. Of course. See, you use that argument, you're right there proving yourself to be an idolatry. Something's lacking that ought to be there that isn't. That's why you're an idolater, isn't it? But let's continue. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I am the Lord, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers unto, upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and shewing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Now, the second commandment the Catholics take out so that they could, you know, worship or venerate things that are different and not the same, okay? Remember, veneration is a type of worship, a little less toned down. Because remember, things that are different are not the same. You have to remember that. I've even said in videos, uh, well, worship is just the same thing as veneration. No, you look in a dictionary, they, are, they have different things associated to them. But the root of that is what? Worship, okay? The root that causes these things, okay? Okay, things that are different are not the same. Catholics say we venerate these things. You're idolaters. You're an idolater. You're venerating the flesh. You might not be scripturally worshiping as the scriptures teach what and how to worship. Okay, you might not be worshiping like that. Scripturally, no. But you have set up an idol in your heart. And hence... You're in idolatry. Okay? You're in idolatry. Okay. Verse 7. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Remember, these Ten Commandments were given unto the who? The Hebrews. Jews. Okay? The Hebrews. We are not commanded to keep the Sabbath today. That was for the Jews. We have to remember that, okay? Yes. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son nor thy daughter, thy man's manservant nor thy maidservant, nor the cattle nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six Days, the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. A day. What is a day? A day is a 24-hour period. We've discussed that before. Six days, 24 hours, okay? A day is a 24-hour period. Are there not 12 hours in the day? Huh? So what, does that mean that there's 15 hours in the night? No, 24 hours, day and night, 12, 12, okay? Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, 
and the tenth and final commandment, which the Catholic, they take out the second commandment and they bump up the tenth commandment and make it two commandments. The final and tenth commandment is, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. And see what the Catholic does is they take, they take this verse and kind of break it into two pieces. They say that the ninth to the Catholic, and we've got a video where we address this, okay? Incidentally, in that video about the Ten Commandments, I may make mention of a Beelzebub of Blackpool. That was before he shot himself in the foot and exposed himself as a, as a Catholic coadjutor working for the Vatican, a lost devil scoundrel that he is, okay? So if you hear in some of my older videos a mention of a Beelzebub of Blackpool, um... That's who it is I'm referring to. And at the time that that video that will be in the description box, I had no idea that this guy was a lying devil uh, Catholic coadjutor who worships flesh. I had no idea. Okay. So just had to put that out there if you happen to watch that video. Okay. And you two go run along like a chicken with your head cut off and do all your dumb little stupid videos. Okay. Got busier. Busy. Got bigger things to do than to worry with you about you two. Okay. But the Catholic... We'll break this into two pieces and say the ninth is this. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Oh, okay, excuse me. I read the wrong one. Verse seven, 17. Thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's house. They will call that the ninth commandment right there in verse 17. Thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. So covet, not coveting is one commandment. Just like the second commandment, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, stars, moon, sun, S-U-N, okay? Or that is in the earth beneath, oh, like man, trees, flowers, cars, pens, whatever, okay? Or that is in the water under the earth. Little fishies. Okay. Octopi. And stuff like that. All right. So an idol is yes. A statue. Yes. A graven image. Yes. But it is not relegated just to that. And when people, especially when they try to be dispensational, when they say, well, in the Old Testament, it was just always. A... No. No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. And, and speaking on that, okay, speaking on that, see that? That is a triangle or a pyramid, what you, whatever you will. Um, this is very big in occultism, cultic, okay? This is, and unfortunately, here in America, we have this. You see that? That's the Eye of Horus right there. And there is the pyramid, the triangle, yes. And this is a Jesuit Federal Reserve note. The, the Federal Reserve, the Jesuits recently did something here in America with the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve is the, pump, is the Pope's bank, okay, by the way. I think we did a video on that. I'm pretty sure we did. But they did something with that recently. Um, really didn't look onto it. But what's happening here in America is that uh, Jesuits are raising prices on everything. <laughs> Go figure. But, okay, this is a triangle, a pyramid. Very big in occultism. Very, very big in occultism. And, by the way, we're going to have some wabbits in this video, so I hope you're hungry. Get your hot sauce and your teriyaki, okay? But we've talked about the pyramid structure before, okay? Now, the way you are looking at this, okay, you're looking at it like this, like I'm looking at it. The left, this is your left that you are looking at, okay? You gotta remember, the way that this works, okay? I'm gonna discuss the pyramid structure very quickly, okay? It begins here at the top, okay? It begins here at the top. And Wait a minute. You see that? What is that? Anyway, it begins at the top. Usually the head of an organization like Arturo Sosa or the head of a cult, a cult or whatever it is, it starts at the head, okay? And then it goes to the left counterclockwise, okay? 
a lot of people like to fill in the levels of the triangle pyramid. Keep it simple about what the triangle uh, structure is. Then it goes to the left. The Interesting. But it goes to the, the left. Okay, and this is symbolized within the book of Revelation with the satanic Roman Catholic Babylonian Egyptian Trinity with the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Okay, yeah, your satanic little Trinity is in the scripture. Yes, the word Trinity isn't, but yes, your little satanic Trinity is in there. It's the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. We've already talked about that. But the pyramid structure begins at head, we're at the head, with all the orders and whatnot, and it bleeds down usually uh, to the one in charge. You've heard the phrase, my right hand man. They steal that right hand thing from the scriptures. But the triangle, the pyramid structure, works with the left hand. So it's the left hand man to the top, to the head of the pyramid. And the left hand man is usually the one who barks who does the biting, okay? They're, they're the front man for the head of the pyramid, okay? Usually. And then what happens is, then it goes across to this side. Wow, isn't that something? But then it goes to this side, and usually this is more of the cheerleader. The, the zealot, the one that riles up the people, the, okay, the head, the brains of the outfit, the mouthpiece, the big mouth that does all the dirty work, and then you got the one that keeps the rah, 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 the troops going. Isn't that something is interesting, huh? But see, the way the pyramid structure works, brethren, people, is, okay, it comes from here, goes to there, goes to there. But see, the things on the bottom, Okay, it goes, it starts from the top and goes to the bottom this way, counterclockwise, okay? Left-hand path, remember, okay? And goats are on our Lord's left hand, remember, okay? But see, the stuff that is on the bottom goes up. See, it goes down from the top, but then the stuff that comes down from the top waters or poisons the stuff on the bottom and then all the stuff that is brought about by the um left hand man and the zealot the uh um uh what do you, what do you call it the uh something of the troops you know the encourager to the troops you will say from what these people do okay and from coming from the head the proceeds you will say from the bottom of the pyramid rise up and you notice how the pyramid is a small point and the base is wider than the top huh? so then the stuff the proceeds from the bottom rise up and see how wide that bottom is making the top extraordinarily rich hmm. and that is the pyramid structure and this brethren people this is idolatry hmm. Wait a minute, let me see something here. Wow. Now, I ask you. I ask you. Does that kind of resemble something that a lot of you are aware of? Yeah. It does. Isn't that something interesting? Isn't that something interesting? Hmm? Idolatry. Isn't that something interesting, huh? Yeah, it is, isn't it? Funny how things like that work, doesn't it? Yeah. But now, okay. We looked at what idol, what an idol is. You know, our Lord says you make no graven image, okay? And yes, it's talking about a little statue, but it's not relegated to that, okay? A lot of times, the one that is your idol is the one that you're looking at in the mirror, okay? But let's let's take a good, another look at um, some at a very good example of this idolatry, and. 
What is at the root of idolatry, of worshiping an idol? What is, the, what is at the root of it? I'm going to submit unto you that at the root of idolatry is covetousness. Now, covetousness and idolatry are two separate things. But what is covetousness? You want it. You want to do it. You got to have it. And you're willing to sacrifice all kinds of things so you can get what you want. I want, I want, I want. I, 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 me, me, me. That's what covetousness is. And I'm submitting to you, dear friend, that the root, not the thing in and of itself, but the root of idolatry is covetousness. Okay, remember, okay, things that are different are not the same. Okay, we have to remember that. Yes, we do. Okay, we do. But at the root of it is covetousness. Okay, very much like you could say, our liberty in Christ comes, stems from God's charity, which is self-sacrifice. Charity and liberty, you wicked little heretic, are two totally different things. Okay, they are two totally different things. Like in the same here, what we're talking about, idolatry and covetousness are two different, totally different things. Yes, they are. But I am submitting to you that your idolatry, your idolatry stems from covetousness. Okay? And let's look at a good example of that. Exodus chapter 32. Exodus chapter 32, verses 1. On to verse 6. Follow me along. Come on. You ain't scared, is you? And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up! Make us little g gods, which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we what? Not what is become of him. Now stop. Look at the verse. Okay? Look at the verse. Moses went up to receive the Ten Commandments from the Lord. And he was up there for a while. But the people, they wanted. They wanted what? They wanted a party. They wanted a cause. Okay? It began with covetousness. Up, make us gods. They wanted to worship something. Something. At this point, right here, they didn't seem to care if it was the true God or something that Aaron was just woo -hoo -hoo, about to make. It began with covetousness. I want. Make us gods. <laughs> for the, as, for as this man Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we fought not what has become of him. And here's Aaron's brilliance. And Aaron said unto them, The Lord rebuke you. Stop. What is wrong with you? What's wrong with y'all? Are you crazy? No. What did Aaron do? And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons, and of your daughters. Daughters. And bring them on to me. Bring me the gold. So number one, they wanted. They wanted to worship something, didn't they? They really wanted to party, and we're going to look at that. Okay? So then what does Aaron do instead of rebuking them? Give me your gold. Gold. Mm. Let's continue. And the people break off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them on to Aaron. And he received them at their hand. And fashioned it with a graving tool, after he made, after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, "These be thy gods." Plural. But he made just one calf. That's 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 brilliant, isn't it? Isn't it? Think you roll that around in your head a little bit, okay? 
And they said, these be thy gods. It's but just one golden calf. Wow. Yeah, this satanic trinity thing goes back a ways, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. You know how he made an altar to the golden calf, okay? You know what these televisions, TVs, okay? TVs are an idol. No, they're not. Yes, they are. Then why is everything in your precious little living room focused on it? How come when people watch TV, they get that TV face? Um, a relative of mine is notorious for this. They'll sit there and like, literally. Gotcha, and, you, and it's spelled, don't they? Yeah. Mm. I just wanted to put that out there. Like I said, we would, we would chase a few rabbits here, okay? But the altar made an altar to the golden calf. The golden calf for a lot of people is the TV and the altar is their couch. Mm. Roll that around in your head a little bit. Or in Christianity, the the uh, all the golden calf is their preacher or their church building and the altar, or some of them have an actual altar, but they're, they're behind sitting on their chairs, sitting there, there is this one guy um, who I had a run in a year or so ago with um, something to do with pigs. And um, he, be he believed he believed some crazy stuff that even uh, the one dear friend I mentioned earlier, even he was like, wow, that's pretty crazy. And yes, it was. Uh, but he would watch these people who had anything to do with reading scripture. He would get that look. That zombified, trance-like look. That happens with religion, so-called Christianity today, doesn't it? You know somebody, unfortunately, Church of the Living God, who claims to be of the Church of the Living God and are rather a Christian, and they're watching that television? Note their face. Spell on them. But... Verse 6, and they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play, to parte. So see, so see, verse 6, what was at the heart? They wanted to play. They wanted to play. So they said to Aaron, make us God. Make us gods. And Aaron, who should have rebuked them, should have smacked them silly, went along with it. Didn't even hesitate, it seems. But went right for the gold. So it's got to be, it's got to be shiny. It's got to be illustrious, right? Right. 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 Now that's an actual physical item. Now go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We will be stopping in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 twice today, so you know, okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 19 on to verse 23, okay? Verses 19 on to verse 23 in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. What say I then? That the idol is anything? Or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything? What are you sacrificing on to your idol? Hmm? Oh, you're willing to... <laughs> so you can get the idol of your career? Hmm? Gonna roll up that sleeve and get the steel of the Jesuit Ponyard, huh? So you can go have the idol of your favorite coffee? See, at the root of idolatry, dear friend, is you. Isn't it? You just have an avenue for it. But at, at its root, 
I, 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 me, me, me. Come on, face it. And remember, covetousness and idolatry are two different things. But I'm telling you, it starts, it begins. The launching pad that goes into idolatry is you. Verse 20 in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We are reading on to verse 23. But I say, the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to capital G, God. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. Hmm. Hmm. Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Here it is. Yes, all things are lawful for me. They are. There they are. God's not, no, God's not, no, Satan's not, no. You ought to make the right choices because the Lord who's living within you, if you are truly saved, born again, converted a new creature in Christ Jesus of the church of God or church of the living God, which I prefer. But he ain't forcing you. Yeah. You as the church of the living God, you can go out there and snort yourself a line of coke. You can, as the church of the living God, go blow your money and go sit in a movie theater. You can, as the church of the living God, go ahead and waste your money and get a video game thing. Go ahead. But it's going to cost you dearly. If you're genuinely saved, no, it will not cost you your salvation. No, or else God would be a liar. But it's going to cost you everything else. Is that a trade-off you're willing to pay? To get into heaven with our Lord's shame upon you? Is it worth it? Is it worth it to keep the little idol of yourself? Do we provoke the Lord to, je Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? All things are lawful for me. But all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me. Yes, they are. But all things that I not. And while we're here, go to, so what is that? 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 on to verse 12. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God, be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, men acting like girls, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, nor thieves, nor covetous, by the way, shall inherit the kingdom of God. Inherit the kingdom of God. Spiritual in this context. Not the kingdom of heaven, because the kingdom of heaven is the actual physical, literal kingdom where our Lord Jesus Christ is going to rule and reign for a thousand years with us. Okay? And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. And the Lord is that Spirit. Okay? All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Ah, brought under the power of any. Oh, 
I'm gonna hurt you a little bit, and it's and, I, and it's because I love you. Being brought under the power of any. How's that drinking going? How's that smoking going? How's that gluttony going? Hmm? How's that concupiscence going? Being brought under the power of any? It's lawful for you. Meaning, God, God's not going to stop you. He can if he wants to. Then your car explode or you're going to get your booze or something like that. I don't know. But he wants you to make the right choice. I love you. Colossians. We're going over familiar things, but brethren, brethren, come on. Playtime's over. <laughs> don't be lulled to sleep by a certain returning to normal. Be on your guard. Be on your guard, brethren, people. And for God's sakes, watch out for these Christians. Watch out for these Christians. Amen. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 on to verse 7. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. How many times have we gone over this? We're going over it again. Mortify. Mortify. Therefore, your members which are upon the earth. Now, now, check this out. Fornication. Relations outside of the marriage bed. Fornication. Physical, yes, but also spiritual. Also, it's not just relegated to one act, okay? You know, you're watching a Hollywood movie, you're committing spiritual fornication. Hmm? I'm not saying, I'm just saying. You really are, okay? Uncleanness. You know, having the garments spotted by the flesh, okay? Uncleanness. Doing things that make you unclean in your head, not, not to mention your body, okay? Inordinate affection. Hmm. Not proper, not right. Oh, having a little bit too much stock on an idol or on an idea, a principle, a man, a person, place, a thing. <laughs> hmm? Again, it's not just relegated to one thing, dear brethren. Be aware of that. Evil, concupiscence, animalistic, animalistic. I want, I gotta have it. I've known heroin addicts. I've known heroin addicts who have sold their bodies of both male and female, who have sold their bodies in order to get their heroin. Hmm. What is their affection on? They need it. No, it began with a what? They want it. And hence, they made it an idol. It starts with wanting, and then it becomes an idol, and it becomes idolatry the practice of worshiping that idol. Okay? Evil concupiscence and covetousness which is idolatry. And 
when you look at these, we've we've said that we've gone over this very verse several times, you and I. But you're hearing it again. See, we're told to put down. I would like to, you know, morte, morta. Okay, I would like to put into mortify death. Mortify within scripture is more of a putting down, not killing. Okay. It's more of a putting down, not killing, even though to say you can kill your flesh sounds good. Scripturally mortify, putting down, I know morte, morta, I get it, okay, I get it, okay, but scripturally to put down, not kill the flesh, because for some it's needful for some to remain in the flesh. Okay, because like Paul says, uh, to go to be with the Lord is far better. But for me to remain in the flesh, for me to remain here is more needful for you. Okay, keep that in mind. But, okay, okay, a little wabbit there. But, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Isn't every single one of those a form, could be transcribed into a form of idolatry? You want that lust. You got that evil lust within you. You want it. You see a woman. Or if you're a woman, you see a man. You make that man or woman your idol. I'm not worshiping it. Oh, no, no. oh. What, what? you're gravitating all your thoughts to it. You're, you're centering your life all around that thing in order to get that. Hmm? See? Idolatry, okay, is a lack of someone, is a lack for someone who ought to have a relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ. But because that might be lacking, he might, you might be saved, born again of the church of the living God. Amen. But if you're in sin and idolatry, ooh, wow, that relationship is certainly lacking, isn't it? And of course, there are those out there who are lost. Because man has a penchant to be religious, doesn't he? To worship something, doesn't he? Yes, he does. He, meaning mankind. So you lost people. Instead of going to God our Father, okay? Instead of going to our Lord Jesus Christ, no. You go to the world. And Christianity... They they like to the you know the lip service and the you know, oh and this by the way this you've seen this this is about the okay sorry about that <laughs> but uh, some will add all kinds of religiosity and adornments and stuff like that and they'll get a Bible this is the scriptures but they'll get a Bible and they say like, oh I'm Christian I'm religious all of this is idolatry. Forms of idolatry because fornication is not, you know, they are forms of it. Okay. Obviously, but things that are different are not the same. But all of these can be turned into a form of idolatry. Instruments, avenues that lead into or used within idolatry. Can they not? Can they not? For which things sake? The wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them. When ye lived in them. Past tense. So see, yeah, you have the choice. Yes, you sure do, buddy boy. You sure do. But not everything is expedient. Okay? Now, let's go back to Exodus chapter 20 or Exodus chapter 32. Okay? Go back to Exodus chapter 32. Now, we, this has to be mentioned, okay? I have to mention this because the, the Aaron here, Aaron the priest, oh boy, he really, he really done messed up, okay? The people came to him with that and he should have been, like I said, whoa, stop, time out. What, what's wrong with you? Are you batty in your brain case? No, didn't do that. <laughs> and th we're looking at this because of some of the excuses that some of these people will come up to defend their idolatry. Okay? So, Exodus chapter 32, verses 21 under verse 24. 
Okay? And Moses, now that Moses comes down, the Lord's like, hey, and we're gonna we're gonna touch on this in this chapter here in a little bit. And Moses, you know, the Lord's like, hey, these these people, okay, okay. And then Moses comes down, sees what they're doing, gets angry and throws them down, the Ten Commandments on the two tables of stones. Then he goes off on the people, rightfully so. Then he comes to Aaron, verses 21 on to verse 24. And Moses said unto Aaron, What did these people unto thee? It's their fault, right? No, 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 look at the verse. Look at the verse that thou hast brought so great a sin upon them. See, Aaron, kind of like with Adam, the people came to him with this. Aaron should have done what was right and rebuked the people. But no, he chose, okay? He chose. Moses is blaming both. Both are to blame, okay? God nor the devil hardly put a gun to their heads to, make, uh, to go to Aaron to request this calf, okay? Aaron was not being held at gunpoint by either to do, this, uh, to do the same thing, okay? He should have chose right, being the priest of the Lord, okay? Moses is rightfully blaming them both. But he who gave me over unto you has the greater sin. Remember that. And Aaron said, let not the anger of my Lord wax hot. Look what Aaron does. Thou knowest the people. Ah, oh yeah, yeah. That they are set on mischief. <laughs> this is the woman that thou gavest me to be with. She did give me of the tree and I did eat. This is the old man. This is Adam right here in Exodus. The book right after Genesis. And that's something, okay? For they said unto me, Make us gods, which shall go before us, blaming the people. Okay? For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what has become of him. And yes, he's telling the truth. And I said unto them, Whosoever hath any gold, let them break it off. So they gave it me, and then I <laughs> and I cast it into the fire. <laughs> Whoop! <laughs> and there came out this calf. <laughs> it's not funny, but it's like, oh, wow, Aaron. <laughs> yeah, you, you really thought up that one, didn't you? But, <laughs> but see, no, that, that's not funny. That is not, I mean, okay, it is. Because we get to see it, it's like, dude, <laughs> what was this, why? 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 Okay, the jig is up, as they say. Okay, at least, you know, priest of the Lord. You're right. And interestingly enough, this, this from Aaron was not worse than when Moses went and smacked the rock twice and the water cushed out, where both Aaron and that incident uh, was the catalyst to both their deaths. Okay, more or less. This was not the main thing that, you know, got God's main fury uh, upon Aaron, so to speak. It was something else. Interesting, though. But Aaron should have been, I did. But we looked at this because of the, some of the excuses that these people who are in blatant idolatry will come up with. And it always goes to something else or someone else. Usually that's someone, like I said, usually that's someone else's who? It's you. It's you. It sure is, buddy boy. It sure is. And now let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Gotta be, we got to be careful of this, brethren. Because with the climate of things as it is today, because of the Jesuit order, those scoundrels and all their coadjutors making, not making you, but instilling in people idolatry, stemmed from covetousness. Okay? You have to beware of this. You have to beware of this in the most astute forms within 
Christianity too. Okay? You have to beware of this. This is part this idolatry through covetousness, okay? Is what Satan is banking on to make so many of you weak. And plus, it is a good uh, fishing out tool to see who actually is and who is not, isn't it? Isn't it? 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 on to verse 14. Okay? Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized, identified unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual capital R rock that followed them and that capital R rock was Christ. But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Why? Now, these things were written for our examples, to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Lust? Okay. Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them. As it is written, and we just looked at this, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Move one second, brethren. Sorry about that. I had an itch. <laughs> Neither let us commit fornication. As some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Talking about um, when, um, what was it? Phineas, uh, Cosby, and whatnot. And we speared those two through the tent and whatnot because of Moab and whatnot, all right? Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of, this, of serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happened unto them for in samples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Unfortunately, we as man, even as the church of the living God, if we are not mindful, we can gravitate into forms of idolatry. We really can. And we really have to be mindful. We really have to watch it. We really have to keep in our noses within Scripture. We really have to keep our noses on the ground. We really need to be in fellowship with other brethren at times. Okay, not all the time because that's not possible for all the people, for everybody. But you know, we are to be there for one another. Yes, we are. But we are to seek God first above all things. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. So don't ever get to a point where you think you is like, well, I've been doing, I've been saved for a multitude of years. I'm beyond idolatry. That, that kind of mentality itself is its own little idol. When you're saying, well, I have many years of experience. That, you got to be careful. Got to be careful. I've seen that in way too many Christians who have been saved for a, multitude of years and it always happens with that well i you know i've led so many people to the paul to the lord i feel like paul or i've been saved for years and years it always has, seems with these types where they almost idolize their longevity almost now some of them don't okay but some do and i've seen quite a few of these Christians who do. That's aberrant. It's nauseating. You know, beg your pardon, a little rabbit. It's like, Lord, when I when I go through the scriptures with the Lord, it's like, Lord, I don't want to become too familiar with you. I don't want to become too familiar with the Lord. What do you mean, Brad? You, uh, well, I know the Lord, and the Lord knows me, yes. But see... There's a danger with becoming way too familiar with him. 
as if to second guess him, as to presume on him in areas where you shouldn't. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. And then, of course, there hath no temptation taken you, but, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but, with, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. And we've talked about this verse before. And look how he ends it here in verse 14. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. Oh, oh, but it's just about the, the little statue. No, it's not. No, it's not. No, it's not. Actually, it's a little too bit broad for most of our liking, isn't it? Go to Deuteronomy chapter 7. Deuteronomy chapter 7. <laughs> Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 25 and 26. Okay? The graven images of their gods, little g gods, and I'm talking about this, all right? Okay, hold on. Shall ye burn with fire? Thou shalt not desire the silver or gold that is on them, nor take it unto thee, lest thou. Be snared therein, for it is an abomination to the Lord thy God. Okay? Talking about, you know, little little Buddha statues, little marionette statues, or whatever you want to call them. Sure! Verse 26. Neither shalt thou bring an abomination into thine house. Something that place, takes the place of God in your life. That is not just relegated to a little statue, now is it? Is it? If you say so, oh, well, the context, uh, neither shalt thou bring an abomination into thy house. See, the scriptures, our Lord is making the distinction between a graven image, which is obvious, and an abomination. What is an abomination? When in regards to idolatry and idols, something that takes God's place. It doesn't take God's place in my life. Oh, really? What, what are you gravitating more to, huh? What consumes you? Some of these devils, some of them who attack me, who have no life, um, that's just, uh, it's sad to say, but it's almost as if they're in idolatry over attacking people. They've made that their idol. Then again, they're idolaters themselves, but I mean, it's really disturbing when you think about it. It's pitiful. It really is pitiful. But neither shalt thou bring an abomination into thine house, lest thou be a cursed thing like it. But thou shalt utterly detest it, and thou shalt utterly abhor it, for it is a cursed thing. Cursed thing. And what happens? What happens? Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 16 on to verse 23. You are being warned. And when they turn up the dial again, and they will, please remember that you were warned. Don't be misled by peace, peace. And there is no peace. Don't be misled. Don't be led astray. Don't be led astray by these Christians turning blind eyes. Be led astray. Deuteronomy 32, verses 16 on to verse 23. They provoked him to jealousy with strange gods. With abominations provoked they him to anger. They sacrificed unto devils, not to God. To gods whom they knew not. To new gods that came newly up, whom your fathers feared not. Of that capital R rock that begat thee, thou art unmindful, and hast forgotten God that formed thee. And when the Lord saw it, he abhorred them extreme hatred, because of the provoking of his sons and of his daughters. And he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end shall be, for they are a very froward generation, children in whom is no faith. 
They have moved me to jealousy with that which is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their vanities, and I will move them to jealousy with those with those which are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. Foolish nation that says in the heart there is no God. Hmm. Living as if there is no God. As us Gentiles were when the Jews, the nation of Israel, the Hebrew, rejected the gospel. They rejected the kingdom. They rejected the gospel. So it came on to us to make them jealous. Okay. For a fire is kindled in mine anger, and shall burn unto the lowest hell, and shall, and shall consume the earth with her increase, and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. I will heap mischiefs upon them, I will spend mine arrows upon them. See what happens when something takes the place of God in your life? Some of you might be doing good. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm doing really good without your God. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you are. <laughs> yeah, Ecclesiastes chapter 8. Oh, oh, yeah. Verses 11 on verse 13. Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Though a sinner do evil, evil and hundred times and his days be prolonged yeah yet surely I know that it shall be well with them that fear God which fear before him but it shall not be well with the wicked neither shall he prolong his days which are as a shadow because he feareth not before God which dances and struts his stuff upon the stage to be heard of no more this is Shakespeare. It is the tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Yeah. 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 And of course, <laughs> Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. Verses 3 and verse 11. You're not getting away from this. You're not getting away from this, okay? You're going to have to deal with this. Hi, we're going to have to deal with this church of the living God. Okay? And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance, and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to belief, <coughs> excuse me, repentance, But after thy hardness and impentient heart, not willing to bend, kneel, treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will run, render to every man according to his deeds, to them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life, but unto them that are contentious. Ooh, like the contentious season that recently just passed. Hmm? And do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil. To the Jew first, and also of the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good. And what is good? What is good? Come on. God. Okay? But glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good. To the Jew first, and also to the Gentile. For there is no respect of persons. God. Yeah, you might be getting away with it, but you're not going to get away with it. Okay, you're not. Idolatry. 
no matter how you want to disguise it, no matter what kind of things you want to bring up to hide and disguise your idolatry. Idolatry is sin. It's sin. Why? It's the act of what? Worshiping an idol. You might not worship it as scripture defines worship. Okay. But it is still taking the primal place in your life above God. Or even worse, you're using that as an excuse to worship God, which God does not allow. That's what it is. You're doing something that God wants nothing to do with to worship him. When, Like I said, the heart of worship, I'll leave that in the description box. Okay? Okay? Worship, according to scripture, is very different to what Christianity tells you worship is. Okay? Oh! Why are we here? Why did God make us? Why did God do this? Right? Why? Why are we here with all this stuff? Why? Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. Why are we here? Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. God created us. Why? Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. How I told you about some like to say, well, God made man just to be a gardener. Nah. No, 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 no. We have been made in the image of God. Spirit, soul, and body. That's a person. A person is a spirit, soul, and body. You and I, even you, my most dreadful, disgusting enemies, you have a spirit, you have a soul, and you have a body. That is the image of God that we were made in, okay? Leave a link for that in the description box as well, okay? But we are made in the image of God. So, God made us in his own image, meaning spirit, soul, and body, okay? Just to be a gardener? Eh. Genesis chapter 2, verses 4 on to verse 8. These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created, in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, and every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground. Oh, God made man to be a gardener. Hmm. But there went up a mist from the earth, and watered the whole face of the ground, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. And there he put the man whom he had formed. And verse 15. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. Hmm. So, if if you stop right there, then it's like, well, see, God made man to be a gardener. But see, when, then when you get to Genesis chapter 3, yea, hath God said. Verse 7 and 8. Oh, verses 7 on to verse 12. We know it by heart. Satan goes up to Eve. Where was Adam? We don't know. Satan goes up to Eve. Yea, hath God said, you're not supposed to eat of every tree of the garden. Eve says, no, we're not. We're not supposed to eat from this tree. And then she adds the scripture. And then Satan says, <laughs> ye shall not surely die. <laughs> For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Meaning being able to judge for yourself. Okay, we've talked about this at length. 
But before the fall, man only knew what was good, and that was God. And then, because Satan <laughs> forced Eve, no, no, Satan lied, yes, but Eve chose. She took the fruit, okay? And there's no evidence whatsoever to say it was an apple. And then Eve ate of it and then gave it on to Adam, who should have been like, kind of like what Aaron should have done, you know? What did you do? What did you do? Okay? Hence, here we are today. So now, after that, verse 7 on verse 12. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves apron. They knew that they were naked because they had sinned and went against what God had said. Clearly, works were the very were, was how it was in the very first dispensation of Scripture. If anyone tells you it's uh, from faith alone, from Genesis, that they're lying to you. How many times do we got to go through this to show you that they're lying to you? Okay, give me a break. But okay. So they fed, they sewed themselves aprons. Verse 8. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. How does a voice walk unless it has a body? Okay? We talked about that before. Okay? But Adam and Eve saw God. And that he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. It denotes what? That Adam and Eve had pristine fellowship, the more rather why God made man in his own image. Okay? And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Remember, God is our father. And most fathers, uh, our heavenly father, wants to have a relationship with you. He really does. Christianity has trivialized that. Christianity has romanticized that. But a fact is a fact. Yes, God wants to have a relationship with you. Oh, don't, don't worry. Don't worry, brother. I, I feel you. We're going to get to it. Trust me, okay? But, so verse 8 denotes fellowship. Fellowship. Pristine, pure fellowship without any sin. But because they, they did a no-no, sin was brought in. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. Now, see, God already knew what was going on. We've talked about this in videos before. Okay? God was giving Adam a chance here. Because... He couldn't find Adam when before it denotes that readily available. You know, always God saw was fellowship. Fellowship disrupted by what? Okay, did God say you can't eat that? Oh, look at that tree. Look at that fruit in that. Oh, you're right. He said I can't have that. And look at how beautiful it is. I want it even more. See, pristine, pure fellowship with the Father was there before sin. Hence, fellowship was the more greater intent to why God, our Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, created us. Not to be just a mere gardener, my dear friend, okay? But see, this is all showing us that before they done messed it up, pristine fellowship, pristine relationship. They saw God with their own eyes, see? The only thing they had to do was... See that? See that? No, you know. You, you see this? Don't touch it. <laughs> okay? He didn't say don't touch it. Excuse me. Now don't eat it. Don't eat it. Okay? He didn't say don't touch it. Okay? He didn't say that. Thank your pardon. But yeah, see this? Don't don't eat it. Leave it alone. Leave it alone. There's all this other stuff you can have. Yea, hath God said, so you focus on the thing that you're not supposed to do. Covetousness. Covetousness. 
It's not good for you. Why is it not good? Oh, look at it. It looks good. Oh, I think I want it. No, you don't. Yes, I do. Okay, you have it. You have it. What happens? You get sick. Oh, isn't that the case with fornication, huh? Oh, you see a fine-looking woman. Or a fine-looking man, right, ladies? Oh, I gotta have that. I gotta get me some of that. Huh? Then, like, uh, Amon and Tamar. His whole world, he made an idol out of Tamar. Why? Because he was covetous. He had evil concupiscence. See, idols and idolatry are two different things in and of themselves. Idolatry is the act of worshiping an idol, okay? But they stem from what? Covetousness. Okay? And of course, verse 11, And he said, Who, who told thee thou, that thou was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And of course, what we saw, Aaron, this is what everybody, this is what lost people do. They won't man up. They won't take responsibility or accountability. But they'll do exactly this. And the man said, The woman that whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat it. Always is someone else's fault. Yeah, I did this, but eh. that's what lost people do. And hence, Hence, but see, God created us not just to be gardeners, but for fellowship. Yes, he did. And like I told you, Christianity, Christians, these disgusting, aberrant, church-building Christians. Yes, they've trivialized God's precious truth on that. Yes, but see, what they do, and this is the, the root and stem of this Foul, vile, vomitous ecumenicalism. Beg your pardon. Yes, this vile, nasty, rotten, stankin' ecumenicalism. God loves you. God's not mad at you. There's something good in you. Oh, boy. Yeah. Hence, there's obviously something good in us because God died for us, right? Lord rebuke you. I heard once Dave Wilkerson um, early on in my walk with our Lord. He said in one of his sermons that Jesus Christ needs us to preach the gospel. I was horrified. I was like, Whoa! From right then and there, cut him dry. And then later on, it's like, oh, wow, David Wilkerson was quite messed up. Okay. God needs you. Well, well, yes, he made you for fellowship. He's lonely. He wants you. He's crying. Oh, no, shut up. Really? Really? So there's something good in you, huh? And see, that's that's the basis. Well, uh, Vatican II is ecumenicalism, okay? But the basis is you're a good person. Oh, we've all sinned. Yes, but you see, see you're a good person. The easy believism heretic, whether it's save themselves by their belief or save themselves just because they call on the name of the Lord. Okay? Um, that's their premise. See, you're good. You're good. There's something good about you. There's something good about you. I see something good about you. And what do, what, what do these people say? Well, God saw something good in the one kid of Jeroboam. <laughs> uh, 1 Kings chapter 14. See, God saw something good in that kid, right? Yeah, yeah. If, dear friend, you, you don't even... You, your, your own argument is stupid, okay? First Kings chapter 14, verses 11 on to verse 13. God saw something good in this person. Let's read, okay? Number one, this is talking about Joel, Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. He has that stigma, kind of like a Nicodemus who came to Jesus at night, Okay? Jeroboam has a stigma that stuck with him, just like Nicodemus, okay? Up in heaven, Nicodemus, who went to Jesus by night, okay? Jeroboam in hell, okay, who made Israel to sin, okay? Some of you are going to see Jeroboam if you're not, you know, but then again, you might be a bit too busy screaming, okay? But this is about Jeroboam, son of Nebat, who did a counterfeit 
uh, in Samaria and a counterfeit feast and a counterfeit temple and made whoever he whoever wanted to be a priest. Okay, you're a priest. Okay, this, this is who this is talking about. Okay, now let's pay attention. Verses 11 on to verse 13 with your argument. Oh, God saw something good in them. Him that dieth of Jeroboam in the city shall the dogs eat. Oh, that's pretty rough. Yeah, let's keep reading. And him that dieth in the field shall the fowls of the air eat. For the Lord has spoken of it. Spoken it. Oh, that's pretty rough. Let's keep reading. Arise thou therefore, get thee to thine house. And when thy feet enter into the city, the child shall die. Yes, Jeroboam set his wife unto the prophet Asia, I believe it was. Uh, yes, Asia. Um, and she disguised herself to fool him that he, she wasn't the wife of Jeroboam. Uh, uh, Asia was going blind. And the Lord's like, <laughs> uh, Jeroboam's wife is coming. You feigning herself to be someone else and tells him about the kid and whatnot. But, okay, that's the backstory. Verse 13. Let's read verse 12 again. Arise thou therefore, Asia speaking unto the wife of Jeroboam, get thee to thine own house, and when thy feet enter into the city, the child shall die. This child was sick, one of the Jeroboam. Now, here's the verse in question. And all Israel shall mourn for him and bury him. Bury him. Very important, because why is that important? Look at verse 11, the sentence against Jeroboam. Oh, him that dieth of Jeroboam in the city shall the dogs eat. Dogs, okay? And him that dieth in the field shall the fowls of the air eat. Fowls of the air, okay? So left to rot to be food for dogs and full of food for the fowls of the air. That is Jeroboam's heritage. That's your heritage if you're lost, okay? You wicked coagitors you, okay? And you lost people. But, verse 13, And all Israel shall mourn for him when all of his has been destined to be eaten by dogs or by birds, okay? And all Israel shall mourn for him and bury him. For he only of Jeroboam shall come to the grave when everyone else is going to be eaten by dogs or by birds, Okay? But this child will go to the grave. He's the only one who's going to be buried. Okay? Because in him there is found some good thing toward the Lord God of Israel in the house of the reprobate, trashy, wicked, abhorrent house of Jeroboam. What the Lord saw good in this child was that the child would be buried, not that the child himself was good. Now, granted, I personally believe, and I believe Scripture backed this up, especially today, that a child who, like, you know, the child who is murdered in the womb by abortion, those children, I believe, are going to be in heaven, okay? They were born sinners, but they are not at that age where they can grasp and understand what they have done against God. They, 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 of course, a, an unborn child, of course, that is murdered. Okay, Children, to whatever age it is for them, can't totally grasp in their brains the enormity of what they have done, why it is. Okay, That's important. Okay, And those children before that time, whenever it is, Yes, age of accountability. Age of accountability is not in Scripture. That is true. But they're going to go to heaven because they can't rationally understand. Okay? They can't get it. Okay? That's dependent on the Lord and the child, yes. But those are going to heaven. Okay? I believe that. Okay? But as far as this, God saw something good in them. Uh, we just read the context. Okay? Good enough to be buried while everyone else was food for dogs and birds. Uh, Exodus chapter 32. God needs us. Huh? God needs us. God needs us. There's something in you, boy, that you're good. And I've, I've encountered this in witnessing to people. Oh, yeah, I'm a sinner. And you keep talking to them. Well, I'm better than this person. Oh, See, someone of the church of the living God truly saved, the, the 
it's petty, but it, it, it's telling. I'm a sinner who is chief. No, you're not. I am. No, I am. Well, I'm worse than y'all. Okay? It's not a, oh, I'm better than that. No. I know that's kind of reverse, isn't it? But see, someone of the church of the living God, you're worse than anybody. Because it's you, not them. You're worse than all. Why? Because it's you, not them. You're talking about yourself before the Lord. You're worse than anybody. Paul, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. And when you talk with certain people, most of them, it always turns around, I'm better than that. The Jeffrey Dahmer thing. Yes, I also believe Jeffrey Dahmer is in heaven, just like King Manasseh, just like King Nebuchadnezzar, okay? But you bring up the Dahmer thing with people. I believe uh, Jeff Dahmer was of the Church of the Living God and in heaven. And you think it, I'm, I'm better than that? And see, whatever your sin was, it doesn't matter. You as the Church of the Living God, in comparison to Dahmer, no, I'm worse. See, that's the fear of the Lord. That's knowing your place, boy. But God, God needs us. God needs us, huh? Don't Ezekiel, what is it, 8 or 13? Don't Ezekiel me that. Get, go away with that. The stipulation is repentance, okay? Okay, you turn against God by rejecting what he did for you on the cross. He's not oh, 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 in heaven weeping over your choice for rejecting him. No, that's what Christianity teaches you. Hence, ecumenicalism. Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy, Exodus chapter 32, verses 9 and 10. Lord, Lord needs you. Lord wants you. Okay? Especially if you reject him. Yes, we were made for, it, for fellowship with the Lord primarily and to be gardeners, yes. But for fellowship. But he needs us. If, if, if anyone tells you that God needs you, get your little tootsies and run away! Verses 9 and 10 in Exodus chapter 32. And the Lord said unto Moses, this is the apple of his eye, he's talking about the Jew, the Hebrew whom he chose. Okay? I have seen this people and behold it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone that my wrath may wax hot against them, and that I may consume them, and will make of thee a great nation. Wow. He's going to kill the apple of his eye and start over again. But God loves you, right? God loved you and gave, yes, but God, present tense, loves you and needs you. Oh, oh. Oh, heresy. And of course, this is reiterated in Deuteronomy chapter 9, verses 13 and verse 14. We won't go there. There are many places. Uh, if the righteous scarcely shall be saved, how, how much more the wicked and the sinner? Okay. There are many incidences that just take that shotgun and blow out of the water. God loves you and God needs you. God loved you. And he gave. Yes, he did. His love for you, that, that he loved you, is at Calvary, the cross. you got to go on his terms to him. Okay? That's what you got to do. Okay? But that God needs you. Okay? Loves you. You reject the gospel. You're his enemy. God's love is not for you. His wrath is for you. We've talked about that before in the past. Okay? Leave a link in the description box. But what, what are we doing in Ezra? Psalm 50. Psalm 50. Okay? Psalm 50. Psalm 50. What does this have to do with idolatry? Hello? Hello, McFly? See, God needs you. God loves you. I, I, I. Me, me, me. You know, a lot of you are your own little idol. You idolize yourself. Oh, I hate myself. Oh, be careful with that. That could be turned into a perverse form of self-idolatry. You love your ideas. You love your principles. You love this. You love that. You don't know who you are. You don't know your own heart. But Psalm 50, 
verse 7 on to verse 15. Hear, O my people, and I will speak, O Israel. I will testify against thee. I am God, even thy God. I will not reprove thee for thy sacrifices, sacrifices or thy burnt offerings to have been continually before me. I will take no bullock out of thy house, nor he goats out of thy folds. Why? For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle upon a thousand hills. I know all the fowls of the mountains, and all the wild beasts of the field are mine. Uh, if I were hungry, I would not tell thee. <laughs> For the world is mine in the fullness thereof. Will I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? <laughs> Offer unto God thanksgiving and pay thy vows unto the Most High and call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver thee and thou shalt glorify me. Yes, you ought to know this uh, psalm by heart. Okay, read this psalm today a couple hundred times. Okay, if you read nothing else. Of course, while we're here, let's look at verse 21. Here, 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 here it is. Here it is in a nutshell. These things have I kept, these things hast thou done, and I kept silence. And we already looked, and uh, where was that? Ecclesiastes chapter 8, we already looked at that, okay? These things hast thou done, and I kept silence. Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such a one as thyself. Yeah. But I will reprove thee, and set them in order before thine eyes. See, these wicked Catholic coadjutor devil scoundrels who worship flesh, they make man someone in their own image of their own liking, okay? These people worship flesh, okay? And they make God into their own image, like he's one of them, okay? Hence, idolatry. Because you make God into your image, what you want him to be, rather than who he actually is, as he wants to be known, as God, okay? He is our Father, but He is first your God. Whether you want to accept Him or not, it doesn't matter. You're going to give an account to, of Him. Where is it going to be, though? Hmm? Where is it going to be? That's the question, okay? And of course, while we're gonna we're gonna kick the we're gonna beat this horse bludgeon, okay? Because I've encountered this way too many times, and you see this also in these poor Hamites on here on YouTube. With their, their charismatic oh, word for today. I got a word for your life. The prophecy. Oh, you! I, I feel so sorry for you guys. I really do. Okay? And we of Japheth are no better when we, when we got blokes. Excuse me. Bloke is a compliment. Uh, when you got these um, imbeciles like John MacArthur. Okay? There, there's, there's, the, there's the glory of Japheth for you. Yeah. John MacArthur. Yeah. Yeah, or that macaroni guy from France. Yeah, there's the glory of Japheth. What's the glory of Ham? T.D. Jakes? No, see, the glory of Shem, Ham, and Japheth ought to be the Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. But see, you're lacking something. So what do you do? You take an idol and put it there in the place where our Lord Jesus Christ ought to be. Okay? Psalm 100. Verses 1 and 2. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Verse 3, excuse me. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his pasture. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. He made us. We didn't make him. We need him. He doesn't need us. Okay? Okay? Uh, Isaiah chapter 10. We're, we're going to bludgeon this horse. We are going to bludgeon. The, and this is not all. Oh! Oh! No! They're, they're, especially in the New Testament. Oh! No! There are a, a multitude. But, you know, just hitting some of these obvious ones. Isaiah chapter 10, verses 12 on to verse 15. Isaiah chapter 10, verses 12 on to verse 15. Wherefore it shall come to pass that when the Lord hath performed his whole work upon Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, I will punish the fruit of the stout heart of the king of Assyria. 
and the glory of his high looks. For he saith, who's the he in this context, king of Assyria? By the strength of my hand, I have done it. And by my wisdom, for I am prudent. And I have removed the bonds of the people and have robbed their treasures. And I have put down the inhabitants like a valiant man. And my hand hath found as a nest the riches of the people. And as one gathereth eggs that are left, have I gathered all the earth. And there was none that moved the wing or opened the mouth or peeped. Uh, shall the axe boast itself against him that heweth therewith? Or shall the saw magnify itself against him that shaketh it, as if the rod should shake itself against them, against them that lift it up? Or as if the staff should lift up itself as if it were no wood? Uh, who is this who openeth his mouth? Without, without knowledge or without words without knowledge who are you to question God who are you who, who are you to say that God needs you me especially who are you to say God needs you the Lord rebuke you and that that brethren people that is the basis for almost all Christianity nowadays Even, I will go as far as to say in King James Bible believing Christianity as well, that God needs you. No, he doesn't. No, he doesn't. He doesn't need me. He doesn't need you. And he certainly don't need you scoundrel devils. But you're going to get what's coming to you. Uh, Isaiah chapter 64, verses 6 and 8. 6 on to verse 8. But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Of course, that's referring to a menstrual cloth. And we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. And there is none that calleth upon thy name, that stirreth up himself to take hold of thee. For thou hast hid thy face from us, and hast consumed us because of our iniquities. But now, O Lord, thou art our Father, we are the clay, and thou art potter, and we are the work of thy hand. We need him. He don't need us, people. And of course, Isaiah chapter 66, just two verses there, okay? Verses 1 and 2 in Isaiah chapter 66. Thus saith the Lord, the heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that ye build unto me, and where is the place of my rest? For all those things hath mine hand made, and all those things have been, saith the Lord. But to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. Contrite, sorrowful spirit. You know, repentance, you know, turning from your self-righteousness. Contrition, godly sorrow, it's your fault. Contrite, sorrow of spirit. Fear of the Lord, you're going to go to hell. Oh Lord, please save me and call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and may he save you. That's the gospel. Okay? That's the gospel. You're not good. And of course, the obvious is uh, Romans chapter 3. There's none righteous, no, not one. But yet there's something good in you. Mm. I think perhaps maybe no. Okay? I think perhaps maybe no. <laughs> okay? And uh, just skipping a few here, because Jeremiah talks about Jeremiah chapter 18, verses 1 through 6. Uh, is it? Yeah. Je Jeremiah 18, verses 1 through 6. Ah, you know what? We got time. Let's read that. Let's read that. Okay? Jeremiah chapter 18, verses 1 through 6. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise, and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. And the vessel that was made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again another vessel, as seemed good to the potter to make it. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, 
cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in mine hand, O house of Israel. See, see, he's only talking about the, the children of Israel and what you call, Brad, another dispensation. See, this dispensation, it's all love. <laughs> Uh, before we go, okay, Matthew chapter 3, Matthew chapter 3, one verse, one verse, of uh, two verses, verses 8 and 9, in Matthew chapter 3, uh, John the Baptist, talking again to the children of Israel, this is before the death, burial, and resurrection, okay, but John the Baptist says, bring forth therefore fruits, meat for repentance, and think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. Hmm. For I say unto you, that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Stones. So God, from, God who made you out of dirt and made everything from nothing, well, you don't think he can make a stone into a man to worship him, to praise him? God needs you, huh? God loves you. Present tense. No, God loved and gave. Do you know that John 3, 16 that you're always so quoting, right? Yeah, it's past tense. God's love is at the cross. You have to go there on his terms. Okay? It's very simple. The hard part is getting over yourself. Okay? Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2, verses uh, 27 on to verse 28. And some will say, well, God's done all this stuff for us, you know, like the Sabbath, right? Right? God made the garden just for us, right? Right? He made the garden first and he put us there to tend the garden. Yes, to be a gardener. But remember, our initial creation was because, number one, he wanted to and for fellowship. But there are those out there. It's like, for example, here, verses 27 and verse 28. And I've run into Jewish people who say exactly this. And he said unto them, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Now, God made the world to be inhabited. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. But remember, God doesn't need us. We need him. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Okay? Therefore, the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. Okay? Okay? And of course, John chapter 8. John chapter 8. Verses 34 on to verse 39. Jesus answered, Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And you can cross-reference that with Romans chapter 6, verse 16. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. If the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. I know that ye are Abraham's seed, but ye seek to kill me, because my word hath no place in you. I speak that which I have seen with my father, and ye do that which ye have seen with your father. And what did they respond? They answered and said unto him, <clears throat> Abraham is our father. Jesus saith unto them, If ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. I have run into Jewish people who believe because they are Jewish, because they are Hebrews, traceable onto the line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that that gives them an automatic in, or they are better off than others. No, no, because if God can raise up stones, what good are you? Yes, the Hebrew, the Jew is the apple of God's eye. But we need God. God doesn't need us. Okay? That is the height of chutzpah, 
pride and arrogancy, chutzpah, and idolatry. We have Abraham for our father. They made themselves. We're Hebrew. And unfortunately, this is what many wicked devils attack in the Hebrew people. But you got to remember, they are enemies of the gospel for our sake. And we need an enemy like that. See, these enemies like these coadjutors, these scoundrels, you know, the little boy and his uh, spiritual daddy over there, they're, in comparison onto witnessing to Jews and dealing with Jews, wow, okay, that's a little tougher, okay? But see, they are the enemies of the gospel for our sake. And how do you witness to someone who is in such a state like that? It's a glory. It's a joy. It really is. It really is. And don't you think for a minute that I'm speaking uh, as an anti-Shemitic. Oh, God forbid. No, no. But you got to remember, they are the enemies of the gospel for our sake. Okay? And such an enemy as that to refine us in our witnessing. Because remember, brethren, the time that is coming is for the Jews time with Jacob's trouble. And as I asked you before, don't you feel a little tugging at your heartstrings to at least go on to some of these people, the Jews, the Hebrews? Because they're the ones that's going to have everything focused on them, the apple of God's eye. But remember, God doesn't need us. We need him. And of course, go to now, Acts, I mean, and there are, you know, Romans chapter 3. Verses 10 on to verse 18. Right there. But uh, uh, Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. Verses 24 on to verse 28. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, buildings. Neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything. If he were hungry, he wouldn't tell us, would he? No. Seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all such and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men to dwell on the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him, and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. God doesn't need us. We need him. So with you saying, well, God saw something good in me. He needs me. God needs us. God loves you. Okay. He was going to kill the apple of his own eye and make a rise up new in Moses. Okay. Um, if he were hungry, he wouldn't tell you. The world is his, and the earth is his foot. The, 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 the heavens are his, and the earth is his footstool. What temple are you going to build him? Okay? He doesn't need you. He, he doesn't need you. We need him. And it's rank, vile heresy. It's idolatry. When you got these people, usually associated with the ecumenical, you know, God loves you. God loves everybody. There's something good in you. That's heresy. That's heresy. And of course, we, we got to touch this. When the Lord saves you, when you come to him on his terms, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 under verse 10. For by grace are ye saved through faith. His grace, your faith. His, number one, faith, his grace. Number two, your faith. Okay? His grace. Okay? And that's not Calvinism, you moron. Okay? Beg your pardon for that. But it's not. Okay? And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works, the works of the law. Lest any man should boast. For we who are saved are his workmanship, a new creature created in Christ Jesus, onto good works, 
which God hath before ordained, not predestinated, that we should walk in them. There is a translation out there, which I have not found yet, that, and not even the Geneva Bible says that. I have not, I have yet to check the Dewey Reams. But it says, instead of ordained, it says predestinated. I don't know what translation that is, but see, when the Lord saves you, brother, he saves you unto good works, not to save yourself or to say, stay saved. No, you have a task. You have something. See, the gifts that the Lord has given you, brother, you are to share. Share what the Lord has given you. Yes, brother, I'm talking to you. I love you very much. Hi. And to whomever you are, the Lord has given you a gift that is not just beneficial for yourself, but is meant to be shared with the body of Christ. Whatever capacity it is, share it. Work out what the Lord has put in. Okay? The Lord has given you something, share it. Share it. Don't hoard it. Share it. Don't make excuses. Share it. Okay? And of course, let us remember this and note the tense of what we're looking at. 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. Verse 19. We love him because he first loved past tense us now i haven't checked uh some of the perversions uh, i would not be surprised to find that the niv in first john 4 19 says uh we love god because he first loves us no it's loved god so loved that he gave god doesn't need you we need god god's love is at calvary you got to go there on his terms, not your own. Excuse me. You don't boot the door. Uh, Jesus Christ is the door. Gee, I wonder what door you're booting out of the way. Yeah, I uh, wonder. Yeah, you don't boot the door out of the way. No, you go through the door on his terms. Okay? Hence, self-love. What is the idol? Yourself. Self-love. Idolatry. I, 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 me, me, me. Let's look at a, uh, let's look at another example of how covetousness would Lee would have led on to, pretty much did, things that are different are not the same, of idolatry. What was the idol? Gold. Kind of like the golden calf. A dear friend, my best friend, was the one who the Lord originally um, shared this onto. And unfortunately for you, the Church of the Living God, nothing came of it at that time. So brother, if you see this, I hope you're okay with this. But uh, my best friend, our dear brother, uh, the Lord first shared this with him. And the Lord kind of uh, pricked me the other day. It's like, hey, hey, talk on this. Book of Joshua, Joshua chapter 7. Let's read first to begin in Joshua chapter 7, verses 10 on to verse 12. Backstory, backstory, okay? The children of Israel, this is, um, they went to go to against the, the people of Ai, okay? And they were, they were kind of flipping, it's like, Oh, let us not take uh, all these men, uh, all these people, because in uh, jo uh, Joshua chapter six is Jericho, how the children of Israel went seven days around Jericho and the wall fell flat. Okay, had a great victory, and then it came to the city of Ai, wasn't that big, and the people say, hey, let's not send everybody, but let's go, let's just send a few and wipe them out because the Lord was with them. But see, they got their ear ends handed to them. Why? Why? Okay, that's the backstory. Why was their why was their ear end handed to them? 
when before they just did what the Lord had said, and the Lord gave them a great victory. But the Lord did kind of put a stipulation about the things in Jericho, and we'll look at that. But let's read Joshua chapter 7, verses 10 on to verse 12. The men went to Ai, got their tails whooped, and they came back. And Joshua's like, Lord, what, 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 what? Verses 10 on to verse 12. And the Lord said unto Joshua, Get thee up. Wherefore liest thou thus upon thy face? Israel has sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them, for they have taken of the accursed thing, and have also stolen, and dissembled also, and they have put it even among their own stuff. Oh, kind of like setting up an idol in your heart? Hmm. Therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies, because they were accursed. Neither will I be with you any more, except ye destroy the accursed from among you. Up! Gotta read this. Sanctify the people and say, Sanctify yourselves against tomorrow, for thus saith the Lord God of Israel, There is an accursed thing in the midst of thee, O Israel. Thou canst not stand before thine enemies until ye take away that accursed thing from among you. What is this, what is this referencing? Uh, Joshua chapter 6, verses 17 on to verse 18. And the city, Jericho, shall be accursed, even it, and all that are therein to the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all that are with her in the house because she hid the messengers that we sent. And ye in any wise keep yourselves from the accursed thing, lest ye make yourselves accursed. And we already looked in, uh, what was that? Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 25 on to verse 26. Lest ye make yourselves an accursed thing, lest ye make yourself accursed, accursed, when ye take of the accursed thing, and... Make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. Oh. So, taking of the accursed thing doesn't just affect you, but can affect others? Really? Yeah, huh? Ezekiel chapter 14. We're coming back to Joshua. But Ezekiel chapter 14. Okay? Idolatry is the worship of an idol. An idol could be a statue, yes, a thought or whatever. Uh, idol, an idol is not limited to a figurine or something like that, okay? It's not what it's limited to. Someone's doing that, they're trying to protect their idolatry. But, Ezekiel chapter 14, verses 1 to 100 verse. Oops, oh, that was weird. <laughs> hello, hello. That was weird. <laughs> okay, can you hear me? <laughs> That was strange. Why'd that do that? <laughs> okay. Ezekiel chapter 14, verses 1 on to verse 5. Then came certain of the elders of Israel unto me and sat before me. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their heart. Their idols in their heart. And, and put the stumbling block of their iniquity before their face. Shall I be inquired of at all by them? Therefore speak thus unto them, and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Every man of the house of Israel that setteth up his idols in his heart, and putteth the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face, and cometh to the prophet, I the Lord will answer him, that cometh according to the multitude of his idols, that I may take the house of Israel in their own heart, because they are all estranged from me through their idols. And what does that mean? He'll answer them in, uh, in their own heart. What does that mean? That means simply, uh, you want to believe in something false? huh? You want to believe in heresy? you got to be careful what you want. God shall send them strong delusion that they would believe a lie, that they should believe a lie. huh? You want the heresy, huh? You want all the false doctrine and stuff like that? Beg your pardon, brethren. Don't know why that did that. Okay? Got to be careful of what you want. God will give it to you. 
And now go back to Joshua chapter uh, uh, 7. Let's read now verses 19 on to verse 26. Okay, Achan was labeled, figured out, fingered. He's the one, okay? And before Joshua, before the whole congregation, okay? Joshua 7, verses 19 on to verse 26. And Joshua said unto Achan, my son, give, I pray thee, glory to the Lord God of Israel, and make confession unto him. And tell me now what thou hast done. Hide it not from me. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Yes, indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonian garment, a garment of Babylon, a garment of the world. Think about this. Think about this, okay? You see that garment. Oh, I want that. I need that. I got to have that. And what could that lead on to? You'll, 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 you'll focus everything around the getting of that garment. Huh? Hence, making the garment an idol through your covetousness. Remember, covetousness and idol, uh, an idol and idolatry, things that are different are not the same. But see, it begins with, idol, with uh, covetousness. He saw a Babylonian garment. You see the things of the world. See how the world's doing, huh? You want that, huh? You want it, right? Hence, and hey, he made this the focal point of everything, didn't he? Now, idol or idolatry is not mentioned in the text. No, covetous is. But see, from covetousness stems what? The worshiping of idols. Idol, covetous, two different things. Idol, uh, idolatry, covetousness, two separate things. But I am telling you, idolatry, the worship of idols, stems from you, covetous, loving your own self. I, 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 me, me, me. That's what I'm telling you, okay? When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonian garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight, then I coveted them. I took them, and behold, they are, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent, and the silver under it. So he coveted. But see, he saw these things, and he wanted that. I say unto you that through that covetousness, because he had to have it, and because he had to have it, not only him, but all of Israel was affected because of what? His, I want it. He made an idol out of a garment and silver and gold. Why? Because he coveted them. Remember, covet and idolatry are two separate things. But I am telling you that idolatry, the worship of idols, stems from covetousness. They are not the same. But it stems from. That is what I am telling you. Okay? Okay? So Joshua sent messengers, and they ran unto the tent, and behold, it was hid in his tent, and the silver under it. And they took them out of the midst of the tents, and brought them unto Joshua, and unto all the children of Israel, and laid them out before the Lord. And Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, or Achan, excuse me, the son of Zerah, and the silver, and the garment, and the wedge of gold, and his sons, and his daughters, and his oxen, and his asses, and his sheep, and his tent, and all that he had. And they brought them unto the valley of Achor. So wait a minute. His covetousness, which I am telling you, led him to idolize getting the Babylonian garment, the silver and the gold. He made an idol out of it. Obviously, it it's in Serhi, he made everything about it to get that. But because he did that, it affects his wife, his kids, everything. Why didn't his wife and kids say anything against him, by the way? They kept silent. But see, in their keeping silent, what he did didn't only affect him. It affected his whole house. These people died because of it. And it also affected Israel. Okay? That's what covetousness can do. 
okay? Covetousness, which does, because like I said, what is an idol? Something that is taking the place of the Lord that ought to be there in you. Hmm? Or you're using it as an avenue to worship the Lord. And you're not to use anything like that to worship the Lord. He forbids it. Okay? Idolatry. Verse 25, And Joshua said, Why hast thou troubled us? The Lord shall trouble thee this day, and all Israel stoned him with stones, and burned them with fire, and they had after they had stoned them with stones. Let's keep reading. And they raised over him a great heap of stones unto this day. So the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger. Wherefore the name of that place was called the Valley of Achor unto this day. And with this, verse 21. When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonian garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight, then I coveted them and took them. And behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it. I say to you, he made an idol out of it. And through his covetousness, he committed idolatry. Covetous. Covetous, idolatry, two separate things. But idolatry stemmed from covetousness. That's the launching pad, okay? And with that, Psalm 10. Psalm 10, as far as covetous. And we already saw that covetousness, we saw Paul write through the Holy Ghost, the Lord is that spirit, in Colossians, that covetousness is what? Come on! We saw it in the book of Colossians. Is what? Idolatry. I didn't say that. The scripture said it. You understand? Okay? But Psalm, where, where are you doing in Ezekiel, Brad? Psalm 10. Okay? Psalm 10. Come on. Come on. Work with me, fingers. <laughs> Psalm 10. Psalm 10, verses 1 on to verse 6. Why standest thou afar off, O Lord? Why hidest thou thyself in times and trouble? The wicked in his pride doth persecute the poor. Let them be taken in the devices that they have imagined. For the wicked boasteth of his heart's desire, and blesseth the covetous whom the Lord abhorreth. The wicked through the pride of his countenance will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. His ways are always grievous. Thy judgments are far above out of his sight. As for all his enemies, he puffeth at them. He has said in his heart, I shall not be moved. For I shall never be in adversity. Covetousness. And Paul links covetousness onto what? Idolatry. And of course... 1 Samuel chapter 15, of course. I, I bet you some of you were wondering, it's like, why didn't you go to this, Brad? Because there's a time and place for everything. Sam, 1 Samuel chapter 15, verses 22 on to verse 23. And of course, we all know about why Samuel is saying this to Saul. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. And in Joshua chapter 6, okay, the stipulation was what? The stipulation was what? Verses 17 and 18. And the city, Jericho, shall be accursed, even it, and all that are therein, to the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot, shall live she and all that are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. And ye, plural, in any wise, keep yourselves from the accursed thing, lest ye make yourselves accursed. When ye take of the accursed thing, and make the camp of Israel a curse, and trouble it. Okay? So, clear, to don't go after that stuff. But see, I want it. I want it. God says, don't do it. I want it. 
You can't have it. Oh, look at it. It looks so good. Oh, yeah, I bet you it'll fill me. Oh, I could buy a lot. Oh, I need. Oh, that garment. See, that's idolatry. That's idolatry. Stems from covetous. Leads so easily into idolatry. Doesn't it? Doesn't it? For rebellion. 1 Samuel 15, verse 23. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. So covetous and stubbornness, idolatry, yeah. Because what's the source of it all? I, 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 me, 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 you. Behold, because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. And unfortunately, what is brought to my mind right away is that disgusting song, When you're crowned king nothing. King nothing. What is man? And looking at verse 25 here in Joshua chapter 7. And Joshua said, Why hast thou troubled us? The Lord troubled thee this day, and all Israel stoned him with stones and burned them with fire. And they had, after they had stoned them with stones. And of course with that, Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Just one verse. Verse 18. Wisdom. What is wisdom? The fear of the Lord. Is better than weapons of war. But one sinner destroyeth much good. And in the example of a Khan or Achan, whatever you want to say, look what it did to his lineage, his family, his house, his kids, everything. All because I got to have that, man. Oh, look at, oh, I can't, I can't take my eyes off it. Oh, I, I gotta have it. Oh, look at, oh, look at that. I gotta have it. I gotta have it. Covetous, idolatry, two totally different things. But covetousness can so easily lead into idolatry and lead you on to foolish and hurtful things. Which drown men in perdition. Okay? And of course... One sinner destroyeth much good. And the example of what we said, uh, read in Joshua, while extreme, today in this dispensation, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 13. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 13. But them that are without God judgeth. Therefore put away from amongst yourselves that wicked person. And what is that talking about? Verse 5, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Someone who is amongst you in open, blatant sin, idolatry. Get away from me, man. I don't want nothing to do with you as when you're in idolatry like that, worshiping what you want, what you think is okay. Huh? I'm not worshiping. Okay. Okay, but you're centering everything you are around it. It's an idol to you. You're an idolatry. And, of course, the one that you know that we were going to, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 on to verse 18. Be not, and uh, our brother, uh, Alexander Hartley, did a wonderful video about how if uh, uh, those of the Church of the Living God should marry a lost person, check that video out. Really good. Really good. If any of you feeling squirrely, uh, you watch that video. You watch that video. Um, praise the Lord. He, um, he made a boo-boo in it, and he made a correction. Praise the Lord. See, see, he's, he's not covering his tracks. We, we make mistakes. We, we don't cover our tracks. See, okay? But check it out. Check that out, okay? But, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 on to verse 18. 
Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from amongst them, among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Flee from idolatry. Whatever it is you are making, whatever it is you are making your little pet idol, run from it. Flee from it. Okay? Flee from it. It's not good. Oh, you have. You are. It's lawful for you to do so. Yeah. But you're bringing shame upon the body of Christ. You really are. And disguising it. Okay? Go to Ezekiel chapter 7. We're almost done. Ezekiel chapter 7. Ezekiel chapter 7, verses 7 on to verse 18. <clears throat> Ezekiel chapter 7, verses 7 on to verse 18. Uh, one second there, brethren. Okay. Just checking on going over my notes again, making sure I had the right thing and saying, yes, I do. Ezekiel chapter 7, verses 7 on to verse 18. The morning is come unto thee, O thou that dwellest in the land. The time is come, the day of trouble is near, and not the sounding again of the mountains. Now will I shortly pour out my fury upon thee, and accomplish mine anger upon thee, and I will judge thee according to thy ways, and will recompense with an S thee for all thine abominations. And mine eye shall not spare, neither will I have pity. I will recompense with an S thee according to thy ways and thine abominations that are in the midst of thee. And ye shall know that I am the Lord that smiteth. Behold the day, behold it is come. The morning is gone forth. The rod hath blossomed, pride hath budded. Violence has risen up into a rod of wickedness. None of them shall remain, nor of their multitude, nor of any of theirs. Neither shall there be wailing for them. The time has come, the day draweth near. Let not the buyer rejoice, nor the seller mourn. For wrath is upon all for all the multitude thereof. For the seller shall not return to that which is sold, although they were yet alive. For the vision is touching the whole multitude thereof. It doesn't just affect one. It affects so many, okay? Which shall not return, neither shall any strengthen himself in the iniquity of his life. You're not strengthening yourself in the iniquity of your life. You're just making a fool of yourself and you're not of your idolatry. And what is a fool? A fool says in his heart there is no God. Flee from idolatry. Whoever you are, that doesn't matter. Flee from idolatry. Okay? They have blown the trumpet, even to make already. But none goeth to the battle. For my wrath is upon all the multitude thereof. The sword is without and the pestilence, and the famine within. He that is in the field shall die with the sword, and he that is in the city, famine and pestilence shall devour him. But they that escape of them shall escape, and shall be on the mountains like doves of the valleys, all of them mourning, every one for his iniquity. All hands shall be feeble, and all knees shall be weak as water. They shall also gird themselves with sackcloth, and horror shall cover them. And shame shall be upon all faces, and baldness upon all their heads. Verse 19. Have to read verse 19. Then shall they cast their silver in the streets, and their gold shall be removed, 
Their silver and their gold shall not be able to deliver them in the day of the wrath of the Lord. They shall not satisfy their soul, neither fill their bowels, because it is the stumbling block of their iniquity. And of course, verse 19, you can uh, tie into James, what is it, chapter 4, this showing us that in the time of Jacob's trouble, which this is a reference on to, gold and silver is not going to profit in the day of ja in the time of Jacob's trouble, okay? But nonetheless, uh, this is a little instruction in righteousness. We know what that is, right? Right? Okay. Um, the things that your soul want the most, usually, is what God hates. Usually. Why? Because the spirit lusteth against the flesh. And we can deceive ourselves thinking, I want that. i got to have that. Okay. Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19, verses 24 on to verse 38. Now, we're going to look at one final example here of covetousness that could lead into not only idolatry, but confusion. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Diana, brought no small gain unto the craftsmen, who, whom he called together with the workmen of like occupation, and said, Sirs, ye know that by this craft we have our wealth, for the love of money is the root of all evil. Okay? This man was covetous. What did he covet? His wealth, these idols. Hence... Hence, his wealth was what? Moreover, ye see and hear that not alone at Ephesus, but almost, almost throughout all Asia, this Paul hath persuaded and turned away much people, saying that they be no gods which are made with hands. So see, we see a link here. Idols made with hands. And wealth. Craftsman. This man was covetous. He loved the money. Okay? What did he say? Our occupation is in danger. And they made idols. Hmm. So that not only this, our craft is in danger to be set at naught. Oh, we can lose our money. But also, but also, that, but also that the temple of the great goddess Mary. Oh, excuse me, Semiramis. Oh, excuse me, Diana, Queen of Heaven, should be despised, and her magnificence should be destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worshipeth. Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth, the Roman Catholic Mary, huh? Queen of Heaven, Diana of the Ephesians. The Roman Catholic Mary is this Diana. The Roman Catholic Mary is the Queen of Heaven mentioned in Jeremiah. Okay? Note the tie-ins here of idols now. This is talking about an actual idol here, yes. But I think we have already proven that idols and idolatry go beyond that. But this is a specific reference to idols unto Diana. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Bravo. But we're looking at this because of what was this guy coveting, okay? He was coveting his career. He wanted to co protect his career, his income. And he made idols. And he promoted idols, didn't he? Didn't he? Yes, he did. So, it was just a career, just a job, and he promoted idolatry. Wow, huh? Yeah. And when they heard these things, they were full of wrath and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians! And the whole city was filled with confusion. And having caught Gaius and Aristarchus, men of Macedonia, Paul's companions in travel, they rushed in with one accord into the theater. And when Paul would have entered in unto the people, the disciples suffered him not. 
And certain of the chief of Asia, which were his friends, sent unto him, desiring that he would not adventure himself into the theater. Okay? I know we're reading a little bit more, but let's keep, let's keep going, okay? Some, therefore, cried one thing, and some another, for the assembly was confused. And the more part knew not wherefore they were come together. Confusion. God is not the author of confusion. God is not the author of confusion. Idolatry is sin. However, however religious and biblical you want to try to make it, idolatry is sin. Making, setting up idols in your heart, whatever it is, whether it be religious, Christian idols, or worldly, television, cars, women, uh, philosophy, video get whatever it stems from your covetous because you want to have it don't you deny yourself if you can't deny yourself then you really can't be a disciple of our lord jesus christ now, hey we struggle at it yes we do yes we do i have a pride problem and i struggle with it every Every day. But it's a struggle. Some take the Oscar Wilde approach. Hey, the best way to get rid of a temptation is to give in to it. Verse 33. And they drew Alexander out of the multitude, the Jews putting him forward. And Alexander beckoning, beckoned with the hand and would have made his defense unto the people. But when they knew that he was a Jew, all with one voice about the space of two hours, cried out, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. And also, too, this is a great example of crowd manipulation. Okay? How it stemmed from this guy, Demetrius, starting off this little thing, and then the crowd was, was confused. Hence, he manipulated the crowd in the forethought to do all this stuff. Okay? Really good advanced, uh, example of crowd manipulation here, which these devils are really good at, by the way. And when the town clerk had appeased the people, he said, Ye men of uh, Ephesus, what man is there that knoweth not how that the city of the, of the Ephesians is a worshiper of the great, di uh, great goddess Mary? And, oh, excuse me, uh, Diana. And of the image which fell down from Jupiter, Hmm. Seeing then that these things cannot be spoken against, ye ought to be quiet and do nothing rashly. For ye have brought hither these men, which are neither robbers of churches, nor yet blasphemers of your goddess. Wherefore, if Demetrius and the craftsmen which are with him have a matter against any man, the law is open, and there are deputies. Let them and plead one another." And see, the world going to the world for worldly things. The church of the living God ought to go amongst themselves. But usually that doesn't happen, does it? No, it doesn't. And who, are, who is my brother? <laughs> not you over there from England. Not you, for sure. <laughs> Nor your little pet monkey. Okay, no, no, you're a couple of devils. But, okay, the point is, look at the emotion that happened here. Look at the crowd control. Look how it began. It began with covetousness. He didn't want to lose his income. It was associated with idols, idolatry. And then from that stemmed this thing at the theater where people were confused, ch chanting one thing and another thing. And then when they see a Jew come up, they shout out, great is the Diana of the Ephesians. So the emotion was high. All because of what? Covetousness which led into idolatry, which led into manipulation, which led into confusion. Hmm. It's a pretty good idea to leave off idolatry. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Verses 1 on to verse 4. There are those out there who preach to you a Jesus 
who is okay with idolatry, who is okay with doing things associated with pagans, but yet that's okay to go ahead and attribute that onto him. <laughs> there are those out there who's like, God loves you and wants to bless you. You know, these, these poor Hamites with these wicked devils. It was like, seven years of favor are coming upon you. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, seven years of favor. Yeah, seven years, the uh, time of Jacob's trouble. Yeah, yeah. God's favor is coming to you. God is blessing you. Yes, and, they, and that causes people to be idolatrous. Okay? Sure does. Idolatry is worse in these Christians than you in the world. Because you in the world, what is, you're lost. This is what you got. But those who are supposedly to be Christians have the Lord. But then again, what is that, you know? Those who are in idolatry are seeking to replace something that ought to be there. And what do they do? They replace it with religiosity. Second Corinthians 11 verses 1 and verse 4. Would to God ye could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed ye'd bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Not two husbands. You can't be of the world, and you can't eat at the devil's table and at the table of the Lord. Okay? You can't. Either or. All right? But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, yea, hath God said, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he, or unfortunately she, these poor Hamites, for if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, God loves you, just God wants to bless you, God doesn't matter, doesn't matter to God how you worship him, it doesn't matter, go ahead and bring in paganism, go ahead, covet, go ahead, do all this, and remember, we're supposed to covet things, yeah, uh, we're supposed to covet what God gives us so we can use them for the benefit of the church of the living God, the body of Christ, for edification. Yes, we are to covet, covet better, the greatest gifts. Paul talks about that. But see, that is for God's glory. You coveting things of the world is not for God's glory. Okay? For if one, for if he that cometh preacheth another, preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. Yeah. Because he's got the credentials, right? Or they got the numbers here on YouTube, right? Yeah. They they create a channel this year, and already they got a million um, million views or something like that and all these and all they're talking about is blessing this blessing this go ahead yeah god doesn't it doesn't matter how you worship god oh you can walk a labyrinth right right oh no you can go ahead and use secular music to worship god no sure go ahead or you can take in pagan practices and call that worship of the lord sure you're an idolatry you're in idolatry. Let's finish this with John chapter 1. Just one verse. Just one verse. John chapter 1. John chapter 15. Excuse me. Just one verse. Just one verse. Hmm. John chapter 15. Uh, verses... Um, one on to verse 4, actually. Uh, one on to verse 5. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth, for, forth more fruit. Now, you are, now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. 
I am the vine, ye are the branches. He created us, we didn't create him. We need him, he doesn't need us. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, he can do nothing. Hmm. That's going to be it for this video. Oh, brethren, we got to be careful with what we make an idol. <laughs> we really got to. We got to. We got to be cautious of idolatry, because if we are not vigilant, if we are not paying attention, if we are not um, steadfast, we can slip away. Not losing our salvation, of course not. I'm not saying that, but you can slip away and find yourself being given over to idolatry. Putting in, uh, inordinate affection on something and calling it worship of God. But God is not worship with men's hands as if he needed anything. And these people, these people, you know, it's like God wants to bless you. God loves you. God loved you and gave, okay? Gave, love, gave, past tense, okay? God doesn't need you. You need God. Beware of idolatry, brethren. And unfortunately, you got to watch out for those who are in idolatry. Why? Because as a Khan, they can bring you down with them. They can bring you down with them. Because it spreads. Like we looked at in Acts chapter 19. It's like, well, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. It's like, hey, great is Mary of the Catholics. Okay? Be careful. Just be careful. Seek the Lord in these things too, brethren. I mean, come on. Seek the Lord. Seek the Lord in all this stuff. Okay? Seek him. Let him guide you. He, he's the one who's supposed to guide you anyway. That is going to be it for this video, brethren. Thank you so much for watching this. If you do, um, thank you to all of you who prayed for my wife uh, for yesterday. Yesterday was the 21st. Uh, we found out some stuff. I'm going to give a really quick update for those who are in the know. Uh, the, the little group of people that we uh, converse with. Well, um... My wife is going to, on April 7th, I believe, she is going to go have her hip replacement replaced. The plastic thing that the ball in my wife, my wife has an artificial hip, the plastic thing in her hip is worn out. And my wife can basically now, if she turns her right foot this way, her hip can dis be dislocated. So she has to have her hip replacement replaced. So they're going to replace the plastic thing that's on her pelvis and put a new ball in there so her hip will not uh, be dislocated. So that is what is happening with that. Also, my wife has to go to uh, someplace else to get a certain procedure um, done that she has not had done in five years. Um, which uh, the, has to do with her pancreas and her, her insides and stuff like that. And we found that out yesterday. And also, praise the Lord, uh, the Lord was able to give provision for my wife to finally get herself some new glasses. Uh, young man, thank you. Thank you for your thoughts. Thank you for your offer. But, uh, you know, the Lord, the Lord provided some, uh, the Lord provided but thank you, you know who you are. But yeah, um, so April 7th, my wife is going to be going into surgery to have her hip replacement replaced. And sometime before that, she's going to another place to have a certain procedure done uh, as well. Um, 
When that is, I do not know. We found that out yesterday. And, of course, like I said, now my wife can see, and she's got uh, new glasses coming. So, yay, praise the Lord. So, um, the coming weeks here, especially in, a, uh, especially in April, um, because my wife is going to, like I said, on the 7th, she's going to have surgery. So, after that, I am going to be quite busy tending to my wife. I'm going to be a husband, you know, taking care of my wife. So be aware of that coming in the future and like in April. Okay. Uh, if you don't see videos for a while, my wife is going to be recovering from surgery and that's what it's going to be. I'm going to be doing, I'm going to be, you know, being, helping my wife out like that. So, but uh, thank you for all of you who have prayed for us and have helped us and contacted us. Thank you all so very, very, very much for everything you have done for us and given. We appreciate it greatly, and we pray for all of you, and we we, we love you all so very much. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Thank you, brother. Thank you, Church of the Living God. There is a light at the end of this tunnel for these predicaments that my wife is going through. But not yet. <laughs> not yet, so. Anyway, that's going to be it. Thank you very much. We love you. There will be another video this week sometime. When we, I don't know, but um, thank you. Thank you. We love you. See you in the next video. <laughs>